Cool. Thanks everyone for joining today and this week. Um, it was pretty great to hear yesterday what everyone is using Basu for. Today, I'm gonna walk through kind of a product focus update. Um, my name is Matt Nelson, for those that don't know and those on the call, I am a product manager for Basu at Consensus, but I also manage uh, remote signing capabilities for us as well with Web3 Signer. Uh, so today, kind of gonna walk through, you know, the emerging strategy, uh, our focus at least for consensus. So anything that I say today doesn't necessarily represent the entire BASU project, but it does represent what consensus is focused on as far as maintaining the project. And I'd also you know, like to invite everyone to realize that anything that you see in this product update, uh, it can become a collaborative process. Please work with me to talk about requirements, what you wanna see out of the project. Uh, there's open governance, so it's not just me and CSI dictating everything. We wanna make sure that this is an opportunity to learn more. And at the end of the presentation, I will talk specifically about how you can get involved in contributions, what the process looks like, both on the coding and governance side. And I also have some suggestions about how we can kind of open up the product kind of strategy for more groups. So I'll give it a quick agenda. We're gonna review the roadmap. Um, we're going to talk about BASU with public and hybrid networks. We're gonna talk about BASU with layer twos. Uh, and then I'm gonna use kind of those as a reasoning to explain our post-merge architecture and where we see the client moving from that perspective. Uh, and then we're gonna end with talking about contributing to base two and a little bit about core development for Ethereum as well, uh, which colors a lot of what we do for about the rest of the roadmap and dictates probably half, if not more of the work that we actually do on the client day to day. Um, so I'll kind of start with the little bit of an overview like why are we changing you know, the mission and why are we focusing on these private networks and why are we kind of refining what Basu is intending to do as a client? So with the merge, we opened up kind of the consensus layer and the execution layer of Ethereum and separated concerns for these clients. So with layer one, Basu is focused on execution and that's really around pulling in data from the blockchain, executing it within the EVM and returning results. The consensus of that data and the visibility of that data is handled kind of externally to the client, at least in a mainnet context. In a private network context, BASU handles all of the components consensus as well, but in these public settings, it is a separation of concerns that I think is gonna color the architecture of BASU going forward and of Ethereum and some of these blockchain related networks. So BASU has become a key part of the proof of stake validator stack and the execution consensus client combo on mainnet. Um, and we wanna maintain compatibility with mainnet, right? Our intention is for BASU to be a long-lived and valuable piece of infrastructure into the future of public networks uh, for cryptocurrencies and blockchains in general. Uh, and we're prioritizing this kind of shift to public networks in terms of the feature development that we're doing at Consensus at this point. So that I'll explain a little bit more of when I get to the kind of layer two perspective, but we're you know focusing on performance, modularization in tune of the like separation of concerns for architecture, as I mentioned and resolving some residual tech debt that we have from supporting these numbers of use cases within the same client. So that's kind of where we are at right now. But why are we doing this, right? It's about in making sure that we can ensure network participation for nodes that are running on BASU. So this means a number of different things, right? Um, it means today that you can operate BASU in a private network context, you can operate BASU in a sidechain context, you can operate BASU in a mining network context, something like Ethereum Classic, and we're, kind of continuing to develop the client towards a kind of multi-chain world where we have EVM, EVM-like chains, EVM-compatible chains, roll-ups, hybrid networks, all this stuff, right? We wanna make sure that we have BASU as a key indispensable piece of infrastructure for the world that is going more and more multi-chain and enabling those connection points between these different chains by you know, building around EVM standards, token standards, uh, smart contract standards, and more. So, you know, we have the familiar license with ja or with um, Apache 2. We have Java, a familiar programming language, um, and, you know, a client you're all familiar with, right? Uh, and now it's about kind of translating a lot of this to becoming the best and most flexible infrastructure for institutions looking to participate and build blockchain networks. Um, that's kind of a refining our mission here into this roadmap that many of you probably haven't seen, although it has been on the wiki for quite some time. Um, with the nature of Ethereum clients, I tend not to commit to more than two quarters at a time, given our shifting priorities. Uh, but you know, this is a kind of look at what I see for 2023. We have quarter one focusing on Shanghai, uh, the fork that will be delivered April 12th uh, on mainnet. 
and also focusing on performance. So I've been touching on this for the last couple of days, but we have a ton of performance related improvements that we've put into the 23.1 series alongside a host of stability and correctness improvements, uh, refactoring portions of the code, retooling uh, RPC to be in line with more um, with other clients like Geth. So we have very consistent results across clients um, and just working on performance, performance, performance. So really this one was kind of spurned by that post merge, um, you know, adoption of Basu. We went from around 1% of network nodes to around 10 and settled around eight or 9%. So we've had a lot of new users and an influx of folks working, working on mainnet that exposed a number of performance challenges. So We've taken that feedback. We focused this quarter on improving that performance, uh, as well as building the features that we need to be compatible with Shanghai uh, and making sure that Beisu can continually go through the transition without issue. This quarter is kind of wrapping up. Well, we've wrapped up most of this work. Like I said, Shanghai is being delivered. We had a flawless early work on Beisu, which was fantastic uh, across all of our client combinations. So a lot of this might be uh, <laughs> not important or kind of confusing information for you all, but needless to say, we're keeping up with mainnet and that is kind of the primary focus for the consensus contributors right now. In the kind of second quarter and latter half of the year, we're going to be shifting our focus a little bit to rollups. The reason being is that again, the rollup ecosystem is kind of becoming the focal point of private networks for a number of reasons that I'll get to later in the presentation. Um, and I'm also kind of revisit this slide at the end to bring back a little bit of context, but we're focusing on, on making Beisu into a rollups engine um, and taking that kind of separation of concerns I mentioned earlier, where the execution clients are focused on things uh, kind of around EVM execution and other components and basically outsourcing that consensus layer functionality. And it's the same with a rollup. Essentially we're outsourcing consensus to this other layer. We're keeping some of the components of execution and we are retooling Beisu to be really suited for that format. So in Q3, we're looking to deliver things around optimistic Beisu packages, zero knowledge Beisu rollup packages. What this really means is client diversity on the, the rollup layer. So if you're using optimistic Beisu, if you're using optimism, for example, having the code base be compatible with that. So they're not just using a fork of Geth, they're using multiple clients, creating more robustness and more opportunity on layer two, but also creating kind of a familiarity to migration path for networks that are exploring L2s and rollups. Also looking to target more kind of neatly packaged mainnets clients. So there's, as I mentioned, the execution layer and the consensus layer. Uh, some of our focus is cleaning up some of that connection points. And instead of having kind of these two separate um, kind of unique components, packaging some of those together to make it a lot easier to get on mainnet without the headaches of overhead around you know, management of infrastructure and some of that stuff. Q3, we're also focusing on the Cancun fork. Um, I can get into detail, but primarily it's focused on something called EIP 4844, which is the first of a set of work around sharding. So if you've heard about sharding and data availability improvements, uh, we are working kind of feverishly to get those improvements on mainnet, which will bring the cost of rollups and other components down a lot. Uh, and there's also a number of EVM changes. Beyond that, a little more, unknown, but we're focusing still on kind of working the code base into that kind of what you know today is these multi-use case separation of use case uh, components. We're taking that and blowing it up a little bit to be a lot more easy for us to manage as maintainers. So that's doing things with modularity, making sure that we have the ability to support these use cases. Um, Antoine talked a little bit about the protocol schedule, cleaning a lot of that tech debt up around how we manage the protocol schedule, how we manage these different paths within the code base to serve things like private networks, public networks, rollups, and more. Um, we haven't really had time to kind of go back and evaluate this format that used to be a lot simpler because there was only a handful of schedules. There are now a lot of weird quirks, especially post-merge that we're looking to kind of clean up. And my hope is that this will also bring the kind of ability for us to become compatible with more chains on more formats in layer one. So if you've heard of chains like Gnosis Chain and others, um, you know Polygon, some of these other things, finding those points where we could potentially become a, port a piece of Hello? Uh -oh. I cannot hear anything. 
Yes, let me just ping them in the room. Looks like there's some issue with um, issue that audio. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, Matt. Sorry, we, we it looked like it got cut a little, but we can hear you now. Okay, cool. I'll continue on. Just uh, feel free to stop me if there are any questions uh, or if there are audio issues. Um, okay, yeah, so focusing on multi-chain BASU, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that one node will run all of these different chains, but it'll be simplifying the process to use BASU to connect to multiple networks. We're also looking to provide more tools and specific features for infrastructure providers. Um, really, that's around packaging improvements, potentially uh, upgrading some of the existing stuff that we already have, potentially migration scripts for certain kinds of chains to move their data around. Um, and you know, one of our final focuses is making BASU an Ethereum reference client. Um, and what that means is that you know, we've, we have things like the Ethereum yellow paper, we have all these EIPs, making sure that BASU's actual implementation is accurate to the T across all of those, so that when you're doing research with BASU on things like mainnet specific topics, cryptography, et cetera, that we are, have the ability to be an accurate and um, basically competitive client against something like GEF, which is the gold standard for that kind of research. Uh, beyond that, tons of open work as usual in the Ethereum ecosystem. We have things like in protocol deposits, proposer builder separation, vertical trees, history and state expiry. More to come on that. Uh, nothing too crazy right now. We are a little bit, um, you kind of wait till those things boil down in the Ethereum research space, but there's a ton of open topics that we're looking to get at. So I'm going to pause here because I'm sure we have questions in chat and in the room. Um, and as I mentioned, I'll explain kind of the why of this roadmap, and then we can return to the slide in the next handful of slides. Um, but I'll go there first. So we are not dropping any existing features besides a handful that we have already put deprecation notices out for, including IBFT1, some of the go quorum mention at all we know you're building these networks and you need to continue to be able to operate these networks uh consensus will just not be building essentially new features uh in this capacity however we are looking to onboard contributors we have web3 labs connor spoke yesterday about how they'll be getting involved in handling a lot of these specific feature requests and bug requests so we still maintain critical bugs uh, that are found on the private network side, depending on the severity. We might not be as quick, depending on what those bugs are and the version that those bugs are present in. However, we do not intend to cut any of the existing support besides what I just mentioned at this time. Um, and we are actively looking to onboard new contributors up to speed on what it means to propose new private features to maintain those features whether it's using the plugin API or the actual code base. Um, so the short answer is no, we're not deprecating any, like we don't plan to deprecate any of those new features. It's also an open source project. If you wish to maintain them, you may just as well. Um, but consensus is focused on these items and public networks at this time. setting um, you still sort of like need that level of transparency for all the purposes for regulatory purposes so with the zk rollups is the intent to move to, to basically make all of the transaction history of act meaning yeah. you know the user actually creates the zk proof and the operator would not be able to no, so I think in the enterprise context, the, the word that we like to use is a single sequencer rollup, where there's essentially one operator that sees the majority and or all of the details, and the proving is happening kind of on the latter half of that. So you don't necessarily need to apply that kind of privacy protection. The, what I'm describing in this roadmap here is for public facing ZK rollups, so where they will need to split and basically privatize the account state and prove it 
within the infrastructure, but not necessarily at the individual user level. I have a specific slide that goes through what that privacy means uh, later on. But to your answer, both flavors are kind of possible. Um, so there's the single single sequence rollups might become more, you know, of the enterprise kind of context for what the evolution for some of these networks might be. If there's not enough scale, if there's more granular kind of privacy uh, stuff, but I'll, I'll get to that in a later slide. Um, but at the end of the day, a single sequence of rollup is where one, and they have visibility commensurate with that. Yes, yeah, sorry, the question, yeah, the question was around, um, around rollup specifically, and does ZK rollup mean that there would be baked in privacy uh, even if you're just a single organization or enterprise using it? And the answer is it is flexible. It really depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was around um, account abstraction standards, specifically EIP slash ERC 4337, uh, and how it pertains to BASU. Uh, so as far as BASU is concerned, since it is an ERC, which is a set of smart contract standards, there are actually no protocol level changes. What we will have to implement, however, is RPCs that enable us to interface better with these bundlers and with the uh, smart contract wallet ecosystem that will be created. We do plan on supporting that as soon as possible. However, the RPC standards are being developed literally as we speak, and they're not ready yet. Um, but we will be building them into BASU, and they will be aligned with the L2 ecosystem. So we're in contact with Optimism, Arbitrum, uh, you know, ZK Sync, all these other folks. The networks that have implemented account abstraction, uh, we've all kind of gotten together and discussed what this looks like, and the output will be a set of RPCs that we will be implementing in BASU. Yeah, so we are still taking some inbound requests for things like fixes for Tessera. Uh, our plan is again to kind of offboard that to other organizations, um, including Web3 Labs. Uh, consensus, again, our, our, our stated approach is that we will not be deprecating these features, but we are actively looking to have other contributors maintain them and build them out with additional components if, so, if, if needed. The question was about Tessera and the commitment. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the call, this roadmap is indicative of what consensus we'll be working on as far as BASU, um, and we are open to any and all feedback from other contributors. Yeah, that really depends. The question was, what is the target TPS uh, and finality of rollups? Um, so it depends on whether you're using an optimistic rollup or a ZK rollup or a proof of authority rollup. Um, the TPS number, it honestly depends on how many sequencers and nodes you have. It, you can kind of just keep layering them on top of each other in theory for infinite scale. Um, finality is totally driven by what type of rollup you're using. An optimistic rollup typically has a finality time of a handful of minutes, but there's also a week, two week long challenge period where you can essentially be, try to prove fraud in the network or prove uh, that there is specific kinds of activity going on and they use game theoretical incentives to incentivize this. I don't think optimistic rollups will see much use in an enterprise context in terms of internal use cases, um, but I do, uh, when I get to kind of the layer three app chains discussion portion of this, I think that we will potentially see things built on top of those rollups. If you think of Coinbase Base, uh, the rollup that they just announced that's built on the op stack, which will take advantage of optimisms, fraud proofs, and optimisms um basically token incentives to secure their network which is secured on top of ethereum um but in the enterprise context the scale i think you know it again it depends on the deployment but you know you worked with the uh the proof of authority roll up numbers before that we did and it's five to ten x scale on the layer one it really depends um so i'm hesitant to give specific numbers but any other questions
Not from us, no. So the question was around incorporating zero knowledge um, components with anything that comes out of Aries. Uh, no, from our side, no. But again, open country. The zero knowledge proofs at the client protocol level, but to support the other environments that kind of touch on zero knowledge proofs. I'm going to just keep moving on my slides because I think a lot of the questions will become more self explanatory and then we'll come back to the roadmap. Um, I'm getting ahead now. So, kind of an update for folks in the room on BASU and public and hybrid networks. Um, there's a lot of interest around public networks in the news, not necessarily Ethereum mainnet, but with chains like Polygon, um, some Ethereum mainnet stuff. Uh, as well as hybrid chains using BASU for CBDC, building on the standards and using things like bridges to deploy back to mainnet. Um, but I, as was touched on yesterday, there's a ton of stuff in the news. I don't need to bore you with the links, but BASU is a complete mainnet client. I know some of you are using BASU for mainnet today, um, but as I mentioned, we have around seven and a half, fluctuate between seven and a half to 10% of network share at any given time. Um, there are four main clients in, in the landscape for Ethereum execution layer clients. Um, and basically these execution layer clients have really strong voices around what ha happens within the Ethereum protocol. Whether that's changes to the EVM, whether that's changes to the format of certain transaction types and things, all of this stuff that trickles down to private networks starts with these four teams um, for the most part, plus Ethereum researchers and others. However, it is an open and collaborative process. These are kind of the primary funnel for these changes, but they're not the only conduit. Um, and I'll talk a lot about core development later, but, but we are one of those four clients and that gives this group of people a voice to influence Ethereum mainnet in a number of ways. Um, we participate in Steer, network upgrades on Ethereum mainnet. We've been historically used for private networks from BASU, but we went from around 1% network share to uh, again, around like eight to 10%. Um, and because that's all because of the bonds I storage format. It's our big differentiator. It makes a mainnet node two thirds the size of any other client in many instances, which is very valuable for people who are running on hardware that costs a lot of money or are running a hardware validator in their garage and need low requirements. Um, not many other clients were built with this kind of enterprise focus in mind uh, or any of the private network features. The only other client that implements Click uh, are Geth sort of and they're dropping support and Nethermind. So if you wanna use private network consensus, you're basically using Besu. Um, but again, that means that we were built from the ground up with these features in mind. And a lot of the stuff around infrastructure support that we have built in is kind of born out of that process. Some more information here on the right-hand side. Um, you know, this is a breakdown of all the nodes in the, the world, in the public. So around half of the Ethereum nodes on mainnet are run out of the United States. Typically those are run in data centers. Uh, if you look at this down here, 66.5% of nodes are hosted. That's not necessarily great. It's not the end of the world. Um, but the good number is that 33% of the nodes, around a third of the network is run by just residential internet providers, which means people stay keeping from home. This is great for the decentralization of the network because um, you don't want, in theory, Amazon or Google to be able to shut off access to those things. Um, but again, the United States and Europe predominantly are the major folks hosting nodes in the Ethereum network with uh, some Asian representation as well. So we had a question from Antoine. That's a good question. I know Peter put in a pull request on the Geth repo to delete all the click code. I don't know if that PR has been merged, um, but so just for, the, for some elucidation, uh, Geth invented click consensus as a mechanism to test local networks and to deploy kind of sort of enterprisey local networks. Um, but Geth is on a complete killing spree with dropping features things like FastSync, um, Click, and some of their older storage formats, and potentially even the archive node. So there's a lot of things shifting on Ethereum mainnet with the launch of the Beacon Chain, um, and we'll have to see how it goes. So again, people build on Basu because we support Ethereum standards as well as private networks, and that was not done uh, in a vacuum, that was a very deliberate decision uh, to support both hybrid use cases and kind of the evolution of private use cases to public over time. So a lot of you have heard about the Palm Network. Um, they take advantage of IBFT2 POI consensus to have gas basically free network. Uh, initially the draw was to have carbon 
uh, reduction versus mainnet. Before the merge, their kind of selling point was that they can have very fast transaction speed, low cost for minting NFTs, and no carbon footprint versus the very wasteful proof of work. Um, if you look at this kind of right-hand side here, the Palm network part on the bottom, that's the really interesting thing. That's just a typical base, Besu IBFT2 network um, that has only a handful of components that make it work with mainnet. They have a very, you know, they have a bridge, a relayer, and then integration points of off-chain storage. But in reality, the, 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 the magic happens at that bridge layer, uh, and it you know, works with the kind of scalable base network in a way that allows users to purchase and sell NFTs on both mainnet and the Palm network. The reason being is that they don't implement a custom NFT standard. They support, of course, ERC-721 and deploy um, kind of these like sidechain NFTs that can then be bought, sold, and moved if need be to wherever they'd like to go. So, you know, I, I like the Palm example because their plan longer term potentially is to, to migrate to this kind of public infrastructure, but it shows that evolution, right? We have an IBFT2 network that becomes a sidechain via a bridge, which could in theory be migrated to public infrastructure on L2 or L3 with a similar process, uh, but none of the kind of architecture underlying it has to change too much. The infrastructure can stay the same, the base two nodes can stay the same. And ideally, if we get to that kind of vision that I'm laying out around layer twos and rollups, they wouldn't have to change that, that infrastructure point as well, right? They would be running provers within those networks or potentially just getting rid of infrastructure altogether and deploying their smart contracts on layer two and taking advantage of publicly available bridges. Honestly, I don't really like this slide, but <laughs> what does Ethereum participation mean for enterprise on public networks? You can get paid, you can stake ETH, and start playing around with public network endpoints and running nodes uh, and get returns of varying perspectives. Uh, we think that the rewards are, the rewards hover from anywhere between six to 10%, depending on MEV and other things, um, not really important to work about. But at this point, I think the proof of stake Ethereum, you know, it's shown that it's sustainable with all of these changes we're making, it's very scalable in the future. I would say give that one six to 12 months before I kind of put a stamp on it and say, okay, Ethereum has scaled. Um, and again, you're already building these applications that are running on private networks. Once we can get over the regulatory hurdles, the network will be ready. Okay, the bulk of what I'm gonna talk about is this kind of layer two ecosystem. Um, but honestly, once I get to the end, we can talk about pretty much anything you'd like to. Uh, I only prepared slides for half of the time, so. Institutions in DeFi need more than layer one. Throughput and privacy are the big ones for layer twos. Um, throughput meaning scale. We talked at length yesterday about how TPS numbers, while they may be misleading, they do tap out pretty quickly on layer one. Uh, and there's some quirks that you can use or take advantage of and tactics and all that good stuff, but you'll eventually hit a kind of hard wall on layer one Ethereum that's either bottlenecked at execution speed or you know, kind of a number of factors based around consensus. However, we need more than that often enough for institutions. Um, auditability and privacy. You know, the, there's some uniqueness of layer one that allows you to try to handle both with things like Tessera and things like these private network transactions. A lot of the layer twos get that stuff for free based on the technology that they're using, um, whether it's zero knowledge proofs or semi-private kind of transfers. Um, it, it really depends. Compatibility with layer one smart contracts, composable platforms, all the good stuff. Token transfers are expensive, they're not private, and there's often not compatibility with the ecosystem if you take advantage of privacy features on layer one. So if you're using Tessera in a private network, you may not be able to port those assets in a way that makes sense to where they need to go if you're interfacing back with public networks. Um, so how do we kind of get all these different components into one network? And the answer is kind of layer two solutions, right? We have a variety of different solutions here. We are not just looking at kind of uh, rollups to, to scale Ethereum. There's also EVM side chains and data availability sampling improvements, all formerly known as sharding, um, that we you know, are, are looking at as the official scaling roadmap of Ethereum layer one. So what is a rollup here? I know this is 
potentially self-explanatory for some folks in the room, but at the same time, uh, a rollup, or if you've heard layer two, is a, another network that takes advantage of the security of the underlying layer one. Uh, in this case, Ethereum mainnet, uh, in many cases, Ethereum mainnet, um, to batch execution off chain and then post the results of that execution on, onto the secure layer one where it can be retrieved later for proving fraud purposes and for verification purposes. So in reality, if you think that I have, you know, a throughput that's limited on layer one in terms of security, in terms of what I need to store on the blockchain, in terms of the budget to secure that network, which I think at this point there's 600,000 validators-ish times 32 ETH is a lot of money uh, securing that layer one, it's a lot harder to kind of build that security budget in elsewhere. There is things like proof of authority consensus where the budget is not secured by the monetary value of the network, but instead is secured by the quality of the validators. But in this case, let's presume that we're talking about Ethereum base layer one, which is frankly, you know, a 100% uptime network with an insanely high amount of money required to attack it at any given second. So you have the base settlement layer, the most decentralized and resilient network. And then as you go up in the layers, you start to centralize a little bit more and make trade-offs in terms of centralization that you gain back in terms of scale. So speed of execution. If I make assumptions about the centralization of what I'm executing, batching together my transactions, I can take the security concerns out of that centralization and take advantage of layer one to bring it back into play. Does that make sense? I just want to make sure that I'm not confusing folks. So yeah, yep. Yeah, so the consensus algorithm is not, there is no consensus essentially, because you're using a sequencer to choose the order of transactions. That means that they, it's a centralized entity that says this is the order of the transactions and these are the proofs that this is the order. You take those proofs and you put those on layer one that can be checked later to ensure things like double spend don't happen and to ensure that consensus is reached among kind of what happens on the layer two. But in reality, there's not a distribution of nodes that needs consensus because this L2 is much more centralized. So they, yeah, you defer to the rollups consensus, which is basically just, I choose how to sequence transactions and I do it. In many cases, we're moving towards a world of kind of multi-prover, multi, you know, decentralized rollups that talk to each other. Um, but in reality, those consensus mechanisms still are based on kind of the Ethereum layer one chain securing upwards to avoid that centralization problem where the users are challenging the fraud proofs or where they're using zero knowledge proofs to ensure that the ordering of transactions and the inputs and outputs are correct. Yes. Oh. <coughs> It can, yeah. So it on la so the, the way that this kind of actual movement between layer one and layer two happens is via smart contracts on layer one. So to Alton's point, there are contracts on layer one that manage the funds that are existing in its entirety on layer two, but they're making sure that they're secured via that layer one settlement layer, as I mentioned. So when users deposit funds into the layer one smart contract, they appear on the layer two as this user's funds. So these contracts are often enormous in complexity and size, and they manage funds across those two layers, and they allow you to basically debit and credit specific addresses, specific accounts, but the execution of what's happening in those smart contracts on layer two is not captured in the layer one smart contract, only the kind of state, as it says, like as it comes out. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I um, might confuse people and skip way ahead. <laughs> so as the merge created that separation of concerns, like I said, with the execution client and the consensus client. 
What, what we use to take advantage of the rollups consensus is this engine API, which sits in the middle. So Beisu is now set up to have consensus driven entirely externally, as far as a mainnet or public network context, which means Beisu is handed down from on high what fork it should follow, what blocks should be produced, what should be kind of, you know, it, it builds its own blocks, but it, it's being told how to be directed. So now swap out this consensus client box with a rollup sequencer that uses the engine API literally to direct the execution environment on what to do. Right next to it, but you'd have a separate process from layer one. I don't know how it's gonna shake out. We don't intend to have them on the same machine purely because the requirements of rollups from an execution perspective are often encompassing of the resources of the machine. Um, but I'd love to get to a point where you can basically kind of toggle these behaviors or in theory have managed state in multiple components, which means Beisu can talk to them at the same time. I'm not necessarily convinced that Java will be performant enough to do some of those things um, without being costly, but we, like, we're, we're thinking these through actively right now, these questions. Yeah, please. <laughs> no, so those proofs are handled by another library. NARC is one example that consensus develops. KVM that consensus is developing where we, we use Beisu to trace the blocks, to sequence the blocks, to produce the blocks, but we outsource the proving of the zero knowledge proofs. Like we, we outsource the proving of what happened in the EVM and we outsource the EVM itself to a zero knowledge EVM, which is essentially translating the opcodes directly into proofs themselves. So that's an even weirder example where Beisu becomes essentially even less of this execution client box than it is in this picture. Um, but there's so many different formats for this that what I'm trying to get to is we're, you know, we're using kind of a modular architecture to be able to pick and choose which building blocks we want to serve that use case in a way that's efficient and doesn't, it has maximum reuse of components. Um, I am skipping way ahead. I'm going to get to, uh, why we're using layer two. <laughs> I'm actually one slide ahead. No, I'm not. Okay. Yes. So now, yeah, so we're building that as part of our roadmap from Q2 in Q2 and Q3. Uh, so our hope is that eventually you can pick and choose nodes on multiple layer twos like you do today on layer one. So you say, oh, I could run get, nethermind, or Beisu, or whatever. On layer two, we want that to be on, you know, on, I'm running on optimism. I want to be able to run get or Beisu. Um, but as it stands right now, we're doing that work today. So we got to build components around things like the sequencer, um, you know, like I mentioned, the RPC tracing, some of the proving components. We're building that all into the client uh, and making it kind of accessible, um, but it's going to take time to make sure that we can do that in a generalizable way, because right now it's very much tailor built to certain use cases, uh, and we want input on kind of what this looks like. But the reason I'm going to skip this slide. The reason we're doing all this is, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So we're building some of the components of Beisu into the ZK AVM. The plan is to roll back that work into the main code base. Um, but for now, it's more of a, we're kind of building it as a MVP internally for to support this network. But again, over the next couple of quarters, my goal is to roll back as much of that functionality as we can into the mainline client in a way that is generalizable to rollups. Multiple types, multiple environments, what have you. Okay. Um, this 
picture that you're seeing is kind of where I, you know, me and many other folks think that a lot of this enterprise stuff is going to land, where we have a multi-prover environment on layer two and a single prover environment on layer three. So what I just mentioned earlier about kind of these single prover rollups where I'm an enterprise, I want to inherit the security of public networks, meaning all the security budget I mentioned on layer two and on layer one. So billions and billions and billions of dollars security budget uh, to attack that network. But I want to bring it up to what I'm doing. And layer kind of three allows us to get there because you can have the privacy of the network by saying I'm a single prover rollup. No one else can see what I'm doing. I don't care. All I'm going to do is post outputs of what I'm doing on chain to ensure that the data and the state are consistent and that as I go forward and transact and do things, that data trickles down and I don't have to worry about securing it with my base UL1 because it's being secured by mainnet and the data is completely opaque to anyone that's looking at it. Gross oversimplification there, but the, you know, the roll-up of roll-ups kind of chain world is absolutely coming. Um, you know, here we have three examples, scroll, consensus, uh, roll-up, and polygon. Uh, we are already in talks with those networks to basically create this multi-prover environment where these rollups can talk to each other, move funds very simply, and they all inherit the kind of security architecture of Ethereum layer one. So this kind of big second circle is that layer two environment, and these are all the individual kind of like L3, if you've heard the term app chain or L3, they're kind of synonymous. These are essentially you know, what you're building today already with these base two private networks, strip out some of the components like Tessera, add in some functionality around privacy and, you know, data availability, and you have that kind of L3 world. So I know that's going to spur in some questions. Let's dive in. Is there anyone else? Yeah. The question was, if we add more layers, do we lose composability? The answer is no, because all of these are being built around the EVM. So the standards don't change as you go up and down the layers. In fact, it becomes relatively more and more composable because when you go to something like an L3, I, I don't have to worry about the infrastructure that's built on the L2. I can customize what I'm building essentially to fit my model of the world. And all, all I care about is that the data that I'm submitting with these blocks and with these transactions trickles down in an appropriate way to L1. Does that make sense? Follow up question, please. <laughs> okay. Only if you're going from L3 to L3. So that's not typically the example. You would need something like a bridge. However, you could go down to L2 and go up to another L3 in this kind of multi-prover environment. Uh, the, the goal is to avoid bridges as much as possible. These bridges are bad. They're very prone to hacks. They're big honey pots. But in this scenario, with a roll-up, you can kind of move the state in a sort of different way and go down and back up as needed. Um, in reality, all the state ends up here but in a much, much, much compressed format. And then as you go up the layers, the state separates into its individual components, but it can be private. And it can, you know, you can do these kind of like big transfers of tokens and, and you can have the data availability that you need. You can even include off-chain things in your app chain. The other parts of the network don't necessarily care if you BS yourself on your app chain. They only care that the security is inherited up and down. Does that make sense? So I can have garbage in, garbage out problems on layer three and still put garbage there, but no one really cares because it doesn't impact this environment. It's just that my garbage is being secured by these other layers, economic incentives. <laughs> I don't like to use that term garbage, but it's basically true, right? You know, these app chains are designed to be an evolution of these private networks where I can have my cake and eat it too at scale because I can run kind of an app chain inherit all the security going down, but also I can have the kind of scale that comes from these L2 setups by virtue of the fact that I'm off offloading execution to potentially multiple chains simultaneously. So we have a question. Yeah, so if you've heard the term sovereign roll up, 
that's also kind of similar. The question was, is this a formalization of a side chain in an environment? And the answer is yes, because it removes that, that bridge component, which makes a private network into a side chain. And the reason it's a side chain is because you're not inheriting the security of layer one Ethereum. You're only moving things back and forth, which means the security of what I generate on the side chain is only as good as the side chain. Whereas in this example, the security of what is generated on the layer three is proven all the way down to Ethereum and back up. Yeah, the sidechain uses its own consensus algorithm, whereas in this case, you're trusting the, the, the prover. So you have to trust, again, if you are a single prover enterprise, you have to trust that you're not BSing yourself. And you have to trust that the L2 has strong enough economic incentives to secure what you're doing. And you have to trust that Ethereum has strong enough economic incentives to, to prove what the L2 is doing. So these ones are pretty much borne out where, it, like I mentioned, it costs like billions and millions of dollars per minute to attack Ethereum. You have 600,000 nodes that you need to collude with a good portion of them. There's strong robustness here. This one is a little bit more dubious at the, at the point in time of right now. There are a lot of you go on to, uh, I think it's L2 beat, they describe the different fraud proofs and risk profiles of each of the L2s. Uh, right now, Arbitrum is the closest to the most robust, um, but there's a ton of details there explaining what are the trade-offs that are being made right now? What are those organizations doing about the trade-offs? Meaning, how are we getting to full fraud proofs, to full like composability, all that good stuff. Like it, they're, they're, being developed. I'm not implying that you should go out and throw away everything you've done on an L1 or on a base two network and just go here. But I'm saying this is the direction of travel for both the client that we're building and using and for the network as a whole, uh, the network of networks as a whole. Intend to go all the way to L1 if they need to go all the way back up and kind of like I'm just trying to yeah. understand that as more of an enterprise view yeah. perspective on it because I get it on on the DeFi space. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, I'm not sure I see it on the like, uh, Yeah, so the question was can I explain kind of the personas and the enterprise use case around why we would separate out these layers and why users would use this type of scenario? So, uh, it's a great question. I think that what we see is the proliferation of kind of communities or like business environments where if I'm a person that's playing a certain video game and they have like an in-game economy, I'm on a layer three, I'm on an app chain because I'm working specifically within that game, but maybe I wanna play a new game tomorrow. So I have to, I have assets that are composable because they're built on a common L2 infrastructure I can move my asset directly to the other L3 without ha having to bridge because in this multi-prover environment, it's secured by the L2. So which means that any other app chain that's connected to that kind of multi-prover world will, will inherit the same security guarantee, which means the token or the asset can move seamlessly from one to the other without a bridged environment, which means the user can switch what they're, they can move their assets quickly without much fees and they can you know, play a new game with the same assets. Uh, in a business context, it could be that I have kind of an intranet, which does, you know, transactions and settlements within my own kind of bank. And I have another bank that's running on the same kind of L2 multi-prover environment. They have their app chain L3 that does their internal processes, what have you. If we need to transact, we don't necessarily have to stay in our L3 world because we're being, you know, secured on this middle layer. So we can transact here without, again, having to bridge and having to worry about the security guarantees because my assets are already secured by this buffer. So it allows for these kinds of like big kind of movements of assets, the big kind of connection tissue without having that bridge conundrum and problems. And it allows us to also say, okay, today I want a new L3 and I don't have to worry about, you know, the kind of standing up of all that security infrastructure 
I'm spinning up an app purpose chain. That's why they're called app chains. I'm trying to do uh, a new financial instrument. I'm trying to provide, you know, instead of trades, now I want to do tokenization of stocks. I spin up a chain specifically for that. It can communicate with other portions of the L3 chain as I see fit. And it can also interact with other app chains via that kind of intermediary layer of L2. Was that more confusing or did I? So this is the part where I kind of tip my own hand is that I don't want you using Besu in this environment. The whole point of public infrastructure is that you just kind of use the infrastructure and you don't worry about the client that's running it. Um, as the person who wants people to use my product, that's you know not necessarily what's good for me, but in the longer term, I you know as a base product manager, I see myself servicing more networks than particular companies. Again, the whole point of why we started building on Beisu for enterprise is because we want people building around the EVM. The rest will fall into place as we converge on these networks. That's the whole, that was the whole like gotcha in this whole thing, so. It's the same process as a roll-up would take on L2 to L1. So the question was how do transactions basically be sequenced and batched on L3? And it's the same as L2 to L1, where we batch and process transactions via that single prover sequencer, and then they you know, are posted to L2 as kind of these data blobs and like guarantees that we make when we post from L2 to L1. Sounds like the app specific sequencer is going to generate some real life proof. For that roll up, they have some other transactions in there, but those to layer two, sounds like, mm -hmm. and then layer two valid, uh, you know, verified that proof. Is that, is that how it sort of like works? Or? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on the type of roll up you're using, um, but in zero knowledge proofs, it's validating the state transition that occurs on L3, and then it's posting that result to L2 as a transaction. So if, if you think of the same exact rollup that occurs from L2 to L1, it's done in the same way. It's validating state transitions, and you're inheriting a security at scale guarantees of layer two, which is a big hand wavy way of saying we do things faster because an L2 has a more centralized sequencer. However, L2 is still faster than L1 because L1 has an entirely decentralized sequencer. So you can see how they connect together, uh, but you're again, you're offloading multiple, like, so imagine the L2 has every state transition that ever occurs on this big L2 network has to be batched and rolled up and put on L1. As you move to these app chain models, I'm only concerned with that L3's batch and roll up of transactions, which makes things easier for them to prove and verify. And then they post those results on the L2, which are rolled up again. Does that make any, does that make it more confusing? They don't necessarily have to. Because you, all you care about is that I'm recording the state transition on L3 elsewhere. If I record my state transition on the block, like on the chain that it's happening itself, then the only veracity is that chain. Like it's only using that source of truth. Whereas if I take the results of the state transitions and I cascade them down, 
I'm securing that source of truth in multiple locations and I'm not exposing the data because like you said, you could use something like a zero knowledge proof or you could otherwise obfuscate the transaction information. But you, what is important is that the output is stored on a chain where you trust the security guarantees for a number of reasons. And again, the reason you would trust L2 is because it's secured by Ethereum layer one, which is secured by the economic incentives of the network. So those are big security you know, things to wrap your head around. It's not just as simple. There's off-chain data, there's identity data, there's all this other stuff. But when you come up to layer three, since you're operating kind of within your own environment, you have much more control over what that granularity and privacy looks like because all you're putting on L2 is a hash essentially of that state transition that shows that it's valid in perpetuity. So L2 doesn't get to see what I'm doing up here. They just say, oh, A, and A happened and then now B is the state. They don't know what that state transition was, but they know what the state was prior and the state was after in an obfuscated format. And it's the same when you go from L2 to L1. L1 doesn't, is not necessarily aware of the roll-up state in the same way. It has the roll-up smart contract, which keeps kind of those checks and balances, but it's not worried about the execution of those smart contracts on layer two. It's not necessarily worried about specific identity on layer two. Um, it's like you said, it's kind of that credit and debit system where they're just keep, keeping track of the state and the state transitions, but not necessarily what is occurring within those transitions. That, that happens on the layer that originated it. Um, It's all state up and down. <laughs> Some of that state just happens to represent monetary value, yeah. So the, yeah, 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 yeah. It can be though about privacy. It depends. Um, the balance would have to remain the same. Like you can't create and destroy value on layer one. Like you have to, yeah, it, yeah. Sorry, there's a lot of questions. So we're gonna go kind of in order. Um, the previous question was about mostly clarifying what I was discussing and how these inputs and outputs are recorded at each, basically they cascade up and down. That's why they're called rollups. Um, yeah, I don't know how to simplify that more. Um, Hart had a question in the back or a comment. Yeah, so this I think is a good example on screen right now. I'm taking, imagine I have a block space of two blocks on layer one, and I get twice as much block space on L2, but at the same time, all of these transitions can be captured in between two blocks on L1. So I have a slot 12 seconds long on Ethereum mainnet. I do a whole bunch of stuff on the rollup because I'm running a super fast sequencer and it can work faster than the nodes in the Ethereum network can. So I get four blocks, which are filled with you know, tons and tons of little transactions. I basically hash, merkleize all this stuff and I put it back on layer one. And then when I get to the next block, the rollup will reference the change in state that has occurred here as its kind of canonical state. And the canonical state will drive all the kind of continuation of that rollup. 
And if you think of this one, it's the same with layer three. It comes up even more. I do even more processing between the space of those two blocks, or even in one transaction on layer two, and it cascades back down between that kind of 12 second block time. So a roll up is called as such because I roll up a whole batch of transactions, push them back down to the canonical chain. In this case, Ethereum L1, that canonical chain can be something else. There are, doesn't have to be Ethereum L1, but in all the examples I've discussed today, the canonical chain is this. Um, and again, you're, you're, you're putting money here, which goes like to your point, you, you have to get assets somewhere. So I have 20 USDC on layer one. I now have 20 USDC in the smart contract for that roll up on layer one, which is instantaneously available on L2. It's not based on kind of a bridge. It's a smart contract guarantee. So the L2 parses that smart contract. It says all these things have happened. And then at the output of this block, the fourth block, I make the state transition to the smart contract on L1, but I only, I don't care about the intermediary transactions per se. That's why they're all, they're all rolled up together. So I take the first input and the output and I update what's happening on the canonical chain by virtue of that process. <laughs> Yeah, so as far as like the native currency, so ETH, that is the case. You can mint, like, for example, you think of like certain tokens, like roll up tokens, like Optimism, like the OP token. So they, they have to represent it in state, but you can kind of mint burn in interesting ways. But if you're talking about like native denominated currency, you have to come from L1. And so that's why the ERC20 tokens have to like move around. But for example, if I'm on layer two and I buy 20 USDC, someone has a process behind the scenes to perform that swap on my behalf, essentially. Because you, you have to purchase from either an exchange or from you know a decentralized exchange in which case those liquidity pools exist on both layers. Would, sorry, like directly to the L2? Yeah, that's, yeah that, that is how it works. So that's when you bridge to L2, you're interacting directly with the contracts typically. You're debiting your account balance on L1 and you're crediting it on L2. What's that? Of the of the L2 and of the asset, right? So like I have had a billion USDC over here forever on L1. I can move pieces of it in any at any perspective because the contract is deployed on L1 and it lives there forever or until it's upgraded. So you have to, yes, you have to trust the L1 smart contracts. However, there's all the, the game theoretical incentives are usually what are used to secure that contract over the actual mechanics of the solidity, which is a whole nother box of questions. Um, back in the back. As far as like Besu is concerned, we will be supporting the infrastructure. As far as consensus's business goals, like this is the picture we see. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean you'll need you'll need anything that happens here looks pretty much the same here, just micro scale. Not micro, but smaller scale, right? So any components that we build for L2 will be reusable up here. It's the same exact format, it's just a recursive kind of link. And the, the, the complexity is in the smart contracts. It's not in the infrastructure code. Yeah. 
So this is where we start to get into okay, the question was around like uh, like zero gas chains and things um, in relation to this picture. Unfortunately, account abstraction is kind of the direction of travel on that, where you have things like paymasters, subsidized network transactions, uh, free gas essentially. Um, there's also work being done in the protocol around multi-dimensional gas, where I can pay for gas in kind of native denominated currency, similar to what you have on Avalanche with their subnets, where you can pay uh, for the L3's activity basically with a new type of token, which would allow a business to create like McDonald's coin and everything that happens in this L3 uses McDonald's coin, but it pays for its security budget in maybe Polygon token in Matic or like something else, depending on the layer two. So we're not quite there yet. It's all typically this picture today is all denominated in ETH, all the way down. Um, once account abstraction gets into play, that 100% changes because you'll handle those kind of payments at the wallet level, and then the paymasters will deal in ETH. So like I'm paying on behalf of a user who uses gives me McDonald's coin, and then I pay the network in ETH. That clashes a little bit with what I said about multidimensional gas, which opens it at both levels of abstraction, the wallet and the protocol level. It's an insane amount of complexity that frankly is still being worked out in real time. And I welcome your contributions on those discussions. <laughs> yeah. Because of the security budget. That's the only reason. So that's the difference I think that people will ha will struggle to understand between public and private networks is that you're not you're no longer paying for infrastructure, you're paying for security budget. So you have to pay to secure this all the way down in terms of fees, but in reality you could choose to run the infrastructure yourself, but in order to inherit this, you still need to pay. And this is cheap, right? This is getting really cheap. Like transacting on L2 is fractions and fractions of a cent. So if you roll up a ton of transactions over here and post only one on L2, you're paying like a cent per transaction. So yes. For network layer security. It's a new paradigm, unfortunately. Am I, did that answer your question? I don't think stake is the right word because again, you're not necessarily securing with the inherent stake of what you're building. You are. Yes, but frankly, this picture doesn't exist right now. Um, there is no, there is no multi prover community world that we live in yet. These organizations and, you know, Optimus and Arbitrum, we're trying to build that. But it, again, I think this is, trying to paint the picture of the next two, three, four, five years. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of the beauty of the layer three is that you can pick all those details yourself as long as you get it onto the layer two chain. It's a great question. Um, the way that I'm envisioning layer two, so the question was if, for example, we have compliance or other requirements that prevent us from using layer two, how do we take advantage of a system like this? Um, it's, it's a good question that I think is the same question we're having of why can't we use mainnet L1 right now? 
once we sort that out, I think that those, again, it will cascade upwards into all these networks for a number of reasons. But at the same time, um, that's a good question. Maybe I don't have a great answer right now. Meaning what, like, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the data privacy comes from the fact that you're you're not actually storing the data on L2. So if you have an L3 that you operate in, you have data visibility. I only, like I said, I'm only putting the state transitions on L2. I'm not actually putting any of the data itself on L2. That one you'd have you'd have to you can't bridge to another network without exposing what you're bridging. Well, so CKP comes into play there because you can make assertions about the data and move it. Uh, that's a great question though. I'll have to think on that one. The like with my kind of cobbled together answer would be that, yeah, you wouldn't be able to go to another single purpose chain necessarily without exposing what you're doing, but you can, I mean, so zero knowledge proofs to your point, they have identity privacy and data privacy. It's not one or the other necessarily. Um, you make assertions about the data and the, uh, like the account storage, and what's sitting in it, as well as smart contract inputs and outputs, and you don't have to expose any of the underlying reasoning. I'll get, this is a good time to go to this slide. <laughs> yes. Uh, the answer is click, fast sync, and archive notes. Those are not deprecated in Geth quite yet, um, but they there's stated plans to do that. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier in the present, the question was about uh, supported private features and support of those features going forward. As I mentioned earlier in the call, we currently have no plans. Like consensus will not be just ripping things out of the code base. We only have plans to deprecate what I mentioned earlier, which was Go Quorum compatible privacy modes and IBFT1. Um, we are working with partners like Web3 Labs to continue to, to provide product level support for private networks. Um, eventually, our hope is to hand off all of these features and they can be maintained however they are maintained. It is an open source project. Consensus will not be maintaining them into the future, but we will not be actively breaking or deprecating anything that I haven't mentioned. Um, as for a specific list, I can get back to you on that. I probably should work on that. Um, but yeah, as it stands, we, again, we're part of this presentation is to lay out kind of what is happening, but the latter. The part that I should really be getting to is how do you get involved in steering this roadmap? I don't want to be the only person telling you what I think the future of Ethereum is. You all should be building it in like in alignment with whatever works for your organization. Um, and you know, a lot of that will trickle back into the main code base. Um, but before I jump at risk of jumping ahead again, zero knowledge proof kind of 101. I have a prover and I have a verifier and I have a ZK scheme. Uh, these are extremely complex cryptographic circuits that essentially, you know, if you, the, the classic example I like to give is um, you have somebody that knows basically, um, 
you, you walk into a cave and you have two areas or two um, paths to go down. At one end of the correct cave, you want to be able to prove that someone is, uh, that someone knows which is the correct way to go to get to the you know, treasure or whatever is at the end of the cave, right? So you have somebody walk into the cave. You're, you're kind of like videotaping the, the output, but you don't necessarily know where, which side they're going down or how they're getting there. You're just seeing them come out. Um, so you're able to kind of ascertain that as they get to the other, I've honestly forgotten that metaphor, so I'm not going to use it anymore. <laughs> but there, it's on Wikipedia. It's very popular. Um, <laughs> but the, the prover at the basic, I have somebody who's making an assertion and someone who knows the assertion of the, what I'm proving because I have the data in front of me. I'm looking at my data. I know that it's correct. Uh, and I have a basically a ZK circuit where I can understand by agreement on a trusted setup what's going in and what's coming out. This trusted setup is where a lot of people get hung up, but in reality, it just means a bunch of participants get together to create a sort of random number that they all know. Art could is speaking up back there. Do you have any? Do you have our our, our metaphor for ZKP? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I just it's so compl it's so convoluted that I always forget. The yeah, so we have agreement among parties on a scheme that we're going to use, specifically what kind of circuits. And again, we get together in this kind of so you've heard of snarks and starks. Um snarks is a, some kind of like non-interactive proof, which means I don't need to actually check all this information. I trust the setup that was going into it. Um, and I get together with a bunch of people and we kind of agree on sets of data. And then from now on, I can trust the inputs and outputs of that circuit. That part sounds sketchier than it actually is. Uh, if you think about things like the, uh, there, there's something called the KZG ceremony going on right now for the Ethereum mainnet, where we only need one honest participant to make a random number that he or she does not reveal. And all of the numbers are therefore random enough that this works. So every person can collude except one person and this will work, which is the real magic of it. So we get a bunch of folks together, we agree on a scheme, and then everything out after that, we can trust the circuit that comes in and out. So I have my knowledge that Hart said, I have a witness, which is this, and I have the proof of knowledge that can be checked without revealing the content of this or even talking to this person. I don't need to talk to this person. I can go to the shared scheme. I can take the verification. I can kind of put it back in a Pandora's box and I can know that it's true without interacting. That's why they call it a non-interactive, or succinct non-interactive something knowledge. <laughs> but anyway, there's different schemes. Uh, there's, I'm not really gonna go into the details. The circuits are those public inputs, private inputs, and the statements of what we're asserting. Uh, the reason I'm not gonna go into too much detail is because frankly, a lot of the map is over my head um, and it's very complicated. But a lot of smarter people than I have proven that it works, and it is a very widely accepted practice in computer science and cryptography. So it, how does this relate to what we just discussed? I have different actors in my environments on L2 and L3. I have a data, and I have people that maybe just need to check it. They don't need to know the actual data. We agree on the scheme, but basically the fundamental building blocks of the network that we're transacting upon. And we can do this proof of knowledge very easily and very, not cheaply, because these machines are very powerful that do this kind of math, but we can do it. And going back to this kind of photo, so we have statements of zero knowledge provers that then verify kind of either amongst themselves so I can verify amongst all of the participants in my little world. And I can make assertions that I prove to the whole world and that we can check at both layers. So 
This has a specific ZK circuit that's set up at the time the L2 is created. Again, we only typically need one honest participant, and oftentimes they have somebody participate and throw away all data, and just not keep it so that no one actually knows. So there's not really a back door into this circuit unless you know fully well um, that everybody that you worked with in the trusted setup colluded, and that's a big assumption because if you're honest, you can just not collude, and that will be great. Like I mentioned, the one that we're using on Ethereum mainnet had 85,000 participants, and I personally typed in random numbers on my keyboard, so I actually don't know what my input was for this randomness. So collect entropy, create circuits, make proofs. That's where the privacy value comes from, because again, I don't have to reveal my data to the prover, or sorry, to the verifier to prove the veracity of that data, which means in L3 land, I can transact all I want, all live long day, hit the circuit on L2, and have a proof back that we can both verify without revealing my data up here. This also goes into account state. Um, I take my the entirety of my account state. I can split it into all these little pieces, but I can still get a unified picture of that because of the fact that I'm using this kind of format. We have the, this is a comparison and contrast for like what we have with private transactions today versus kind of what is going on uh, with uh, SNARKs privacy. So you all know and potentially love or hate private transactions, privacy group A, privacy group B. Privacy group A can see all of the data, but not necessarily what's going on in these nodes. For now, ignore the, this, this is one base network. And then obviously privacy group B looks at this uh, privacy. However, what's not pictured is the Tessera nodes that need to be running and the contracts and, and extra code that, that need to be managing all of this information. What's also not pictured is the fact that you have a separate state that's being managed in the privacy subgroups to be able to coordinate all of that stuff. The difference on the SNARK side is that we have a unified picture of the state, but I potentially only have my verifier data. So if you go back to the previous picture, I only control the data that I, I on my node, that represents my picture of the worlds. I put it into that ZKP scheme and we have a unified state. But again, only my inputs are revealed to me. A lot more effective at managing unified state without having to set up the actual management of the privacy groups. And another of the pro is that you get higher throughput because it's just, well, you know, part of it is that you're not doing all these round trips. You're not running on an L1, but you have a unified state with token transfers at scale that's fully private or as private as you would like. ZK ABMs sort of invalidate this a little bit because they're slow right now, but they're getting a lot faster. The concept of a ZK ABM is the same as with state. Instead of verifying the inputs and outputs, I verify all the opcodes and things that go into the EVM. So I put my EVM execution as the verified, let me go back to the previous picture. I have EVM execution that I do. I basically use, I run a big old trace. If you're familiar with the trace logs in Besu, it just does a huge dump of the execution. <coughs> and by huge, I mean huge. They're like 30 gig tapes on sometimes. Into the EVM. I put that in, into the prover in the ZKP and I have a verified execution of the EVM. That is an extreme oversimplification of the process. It takes a lot of work and uses very heavy hash algorithms and super, super beefy computers. But at the end of the day, ASU does a big old trace of what happened within the EVM. We dump that trace into a zero knowledge circuit. The circuit proves that the trace, that the EVM execution happened in the order that it said it did on the state that it said it did and then it posts that output, but none of that is revealed. So that means you have private smart contract execution for the specific provers, but you have the state transitions managed across that account, unified account state, like I mentioned here. Again, a simplification, um, but imagine you turn the whole EVM into one big old circuit and the inputs and outputs are those provers and verifiers. Question in the back.
I see what you're saying. Um, let me reiterate the question to make sure that I have it correct. So the question is around uh, when you're using kind of this multi-layer model and you're using zero knowledge proofs, how do you kind of share the proving schemes across the layers in a way that means I can transact up and down without my data becoming garbage and move it across layers in a way that's cohesive? Is that right? Yeah, so that's the crappy part is that we run the risk of creating the same silos that we had before in this model uh, that doesn't necessarily solve that challenge. The, the, so if you look at these, this kind of unified version of state that I discussed, this does not actually cross the layers. Like I mentioned with before, when you do that kind of roll up process to move up and down, you lose granularity of data for a number of reasons because one, you want to preserve privacy often, um, but two, I'm only posting like the results of all of this to L2. So that doesn't mean that someone can come say, oh, you know, so-and-so has an account over here that I want to be able to pull that data. You would need to basically request that data from the provider themselves. So we do run the risk of creating innumerable silos again. Um, Counterpoint to that is that it doesn't necessarily have to be designed in that way. You can design it in a way where I can traverse those links and get the data because it's you can unroll all of that state if you have the appropriate access, right? Well, right now it's, uh, you mean the roll up state on L1? I gotcha. So that's entirely dependent on the whole, on the roll up operator to, to decide. It's all the Ethereum standards. So the question was, um, how do we standardize? Is there work being done around standardization of the movement of data across these layers? So once you get from, from L1 and L2, it's identical. Ethereum based standards, all of it is the same. On L2, the data is typically available. In an optimistic roll up sense, it, that has to be the case because otherwise you can't prove fraud. In a ZK roll up, it's based on this proving, proving scheme where you can't even make a modification to state that is invalid because the, it won't satisfy the zero knowledge proof. 
So it is dependent upon one, the roll-up operator, what do they want to do is right? It could be a public L3 or it could be an L3 that is completely opaque. And they only inherit the security architecture of L2. They don't inherit like the transparency and all that good stuff that we like blockchain for in many respects, because it's a choice. So they could have the most opaque state in the world and just take advantage of the security budget of L2 and share nothing. So when we talk about regulatory compliance and data privacy and all this stuff, it's mostly a matter of getting people comfortable with the fact that you can't really unwind this data if you choose to make it so. It's just about the security assumptions, which is a hard pill to swallow if you're a regulator or you know, someone else. Yeah, so, yes, so you're, you're doing that, but maybe that's all you want, right? Maybe all you want is a cheap state machine that allows you to keep consistency and consensus among a state group of participants for low costs. That is one great use case of L3. Um, another one is, like I said, kind of like just I'm running a world that has custom rules, but maybe it's open. There's permissioned and public L3s. Like you can kind of design it however you'd like. Public permissioned is the word that a lot of people will be using around this. You've heard of private permission, public permissionless. Public permission and public permissionless are both applicable in this instance. The reason it's public is because of the security budget and all the other stuff that I mentioned on L2 and L1. The data is not inherently public or it has to be permissioned. Sounds like if we were to go with the L3 approach, where you would have a, you know, a, a, a absence of the uh, setup where one state does could have its own sequence of with a bunch of accounts that they can um, you know, support uh, transactions with, and the other trade does could have another sequence of so when it comes to L2, it sounds like they, they won't be able to uh, accomplish that. They won't be able to see each other's transactions, but in terms of state transitions, it's, it's all handled. So, so you want the trading desks to be separate, correct? I want the trading desks to be separate. I want them to also perform very fast, like yeah. thousands of transactions. Like, uh, but I don't want them to know each other's trades. Yeah, so this is, the question was around like, um, basically L3 and privacy as it pertains to individual state held on those kind of environments, let's say. And the environments in this case are two trading desks. Um, yeah, this is, so it doesn't even have to be that complicated. Node one, node two, trading desk one, trading desk two, trading desk one keeps a uh, record of these accounts, like literally Ethereum accounts. Trading desk two has, has access to these accounts, you know, other trade desk sure. And they, in the zero knowledge format, this state is technically unified across all three, but I'm doing the proofs prior to commitment of the state in many cases. So I can transact and do all that good stuff on my local you know, situation, presuming that I have access to all that data. I prove it prior to even sending it to the sequencer. I can have one sequencer that can handle all of this. And the state is unified via the like the snark scheme as opposed to me saying, you know, oh, like, let me have a separate roll up that we can both inherit now too. These are all one kind of network and they split the state via these zero knowledge proofs and they only verify what they have. And then the sequencer and the world state of these base nodes coordinate to say, this is the full picture of the proven state based on the private or based on the zero knowledge circuits. So it's a real, that's like super powerful stuff. Like if, you know, I want to, again, caveat that this 
your world where they have 1,000 PPS is not real yet. It's too expensive to run the machines on these circuits now. We expect this cost to go way down because uh, there'll be basically specific hardware to do these kinds of proofs as they gain more proliferation. Like yeah, similar to like ASICs, but just for these kind of CKPs. But yeah, so, so to reiterate what I just mentioned, you can have a unified slash private state and verify the correctness of the entire state by using the same commitment scheme and having the same nodes kind of gossip around already proven state transitions and account storages, basically. So I say, oh, I transact, you know, 300 from here to here. I prove that whole thing. I push it up to the main picture. And then the, the correct state transition is proliferated to other nodes as gossip. And they just say, oh, I'm applying this state transition. I check the proof really quick. Because checking the proof is really easy. Generating it is not. So that's the cheap part that Hart was mentioning. I, I'm base to node B. I see the proof come in. I check it. I say, that's cool. That makes sense. I update my state without knowing any of the data underneath it. So these trading desks can stay in sync without knowing what any of them are actually doing as long as they're on the same commitment scheme, which is a relatively simple thing to get commitment from, especially in a business context where if you're business A and business B and you're different banks, you're going to sure as hell not share your randomness with the other bank who's committing to the same kind of setup, right? So the collusion is a lot harder, especially when there's competing business needs on the same kind of marketplace almost. It's really cool. Like this stuff is, there's a reason I'm talking about it. It's very interesting stuff and it has a lot of potential. Um, as in, the only caveat that I mentioned is it's kind of slow for now. Uh, I think it'll get a lot faster. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's just it's to scale more because you want to be able to divide and it's to scale. For now, like I said, for now, yes. But but if you like, so this could be kind of like a, this could be an L3 or an L2 world. You could set up a ASU Bank L2 and then just post to Ethereum. It doesn't need to be an L3. Um, this could be a multi-prover scenario where I want to work with other banks that I'm not necessarily trusting to sing singularly sequence transactions. Because if I don't trust another party, but I have a singular sequencer, they can kind of collude to move the order of transactions in a way that might benefit them. Because the sequencer is the centralization point. That's why we have, in this scenario, we want L2 to be kind of a multi-prover, multi-sequencer environment where they can't collude across the sequence of those transactions because, you know, I don't necessarily know, first of all, what's coming in in order to collude because I'm just getting hashes and I'm kind of just blindly executing data here. But there's also like, for example, if, if this was all run by one operator, then they could say, oh, you know, I don't like the way that these look for maybe MEV purposes or something else. So I'm going to swap two transactions. Um, but the, the multi-prover environment, this is where it gets a little complex. It's basically decentralized sequencers, decentralized provers, which means my transaction is routed and split up into different pieces. And it's kind of impossible to, to know what's happening and to collude like that. Again, this is an aspirational photo. We are trying to build a multi-prover world. There's active discussion among layer twos in building this world right now. Um, but frankly, if you go to that website, D5 beat, they, or L2 beat, there are a ton of trade-offs in security in like the security perspective right now. So it's not built quite yet. Yeah. Yeah. Or you, yeah, you execute between the, you know, there's 12 second block times on Ethereum L1, but I might have 200 blocks come in at the same time. 200 you know sets of transactions that I kind of group all together in those tinier state transitioning commitments because the ZK uh, B commitments are also really small. Same with optimistic role of commitments. Since you're just basically saying this state transition happened as opposed to talking about the entire state transition, it makes it a lot cheaper and smaller and we dump it here on L1. Okay. Uh, going back to one of the examples of the 
Um, I don't quite remember that, but I mean, in theory, you shouldn't need a kind of like a middleman in any of these. You just kind of go. If you want to go. Do you mean like? Oh, I just just said you make it more efficient by sharing it. You can have multiple transitions that can privately say that I can internally write all three. I can move out internally and A B C C. But on 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 L two, yeah, on on the layer below you, you only care about the output and the input. You would need to commit all of these changes on the originating layer because otherwise you could double spend. Okay. So like if I A pays B A pays C or A pays B B whatever, yeah, these are they need to keep track of everything, but this guy only cares about the, the final results and kind of the inputs. That's the this is the industry perspective, yeah. So the question was, what is, where is this vision coming from? And like I mentioned, these are different companies. Like we're working with other L2 companies to build this kind of vision because we know that a single sequencer, single prover approach is, will not be trusted. Because you can collude on a single, like, like I mentioned, a single per person can come in and kind of be like, well, we don't, you know, a single sequencer, single prover scenario is semi-trusted because the users can kind of prove what's happening. You know, they can make fraud proofs, all that good stuff. But the there's there's a, the ability to collude when you have a single organization centralized sequencer because they can order transactions in theory in a way that benefits the operator. And that's why we're working toward this kind of multi prover scenario. Any more questions here? Okay. If in a perfect world, Beisu. Execution lives here, base two execution lives here, and it lives in every one of these nets. So okay. base two is executing EVM code, it's batching up transactions, it's producing blocks, and they're sequenced and proven by the L2 infrastructure, not by base two. Base two is not intending to create like zero knowledge proofs to do this stuff. It's not intending to sequence the trans. Well, you might be modifying base two to become sequencer appropriate, but so it, it, it's not meant to like do the heavy lifting of the like proofs and ensuring certain things. It will record state. It will produce blocks, post blocks. It will execute things in certain instances. Certain instances. The zk EVM that I'm describing in the consensus example does not use Basu's EVM. It's basically a custom EVM that is built around zk circuits. But Basu, as was mentioned earlier, has a EVM library that can be ripped and replaced. Um, so we basically do that, and we've, we're modifying other components in Basu to make the rest of it work. And again, I want to make sure that it's known that we're we're intending to generalize this so that Basu lives at these different layers, and we use different building blocks to get there. So this is a great segue to where Basu architecture. Uh, I think I'm you know where we'd like the project to go as far as public networks are concerned. Um, Merck recap. Consensus. This is the pre-merge uh, picture on the left and the post-merge picture on the right. Pre-merge picture, you have POW consensus wrapping the execution layer in complex wasteful math. So you have this is the EVM, basically the block. A lot of transactions come in, a lot of execution happens, and then you wrap the security of this in the complex math that is pre -merge. Um Private networks do the same thing, but instead of POW, write QBFT, IBFT. What have you? This basically is unchanged with some caveats. Um, consensus wraps EVM execution, secures it on a chain. The same thing happens kind of on the right hand side, except instead of wrapping EVM execution in POW, we wrap it in a whole new process that is built purely for proof of stake in the Ethereum context. So, again, this is just the Ethereum context. Um, we have its own layer known as the beacon chain. The beacon chain is separated into slots. Uh, instead of blocks. Blocks can exist at every slot, and they basically do, but not every slot is required to have a block. The slots also have attestations. So these are the witness signatures, essentially, that show that that slot is valid. It's other nodes that go in. They are separated logically, uh, and they attest to these things, and it iterates over the entire set of validators in the network so that collusion is harder and more difficult. Super simplification. Um, we still have this consensus layer that secures EVM execution. Because if we didn't have agreement among parties on what actually happened in those transactions, 
It's the same problem I talked about in the roll-up example. So we have to prove what happens in here is valid. And the consensus layer provides a bunch of witnesses, signatures, and all that good stuff, which is aggregated and then put into one block that is this whole big thing, which has attestations. Uh, it has potential validator exits. It has withdrawals, um, which is not in this whole diagram. It has the you know, signatures from the, the individual block proposer and other stuff. So where does BASU fit in? Um, this is from our very own documentation. Execution clients such as BASU manage the execution layer, including executing transactions and updating the world state. Execution clients serve JSON RPC API requests and communicate with each other on a peer-to-peer -peer network. The real magic is this engine API. Um, this was created to allow those two layers to seamlessly communicate with each other. This is a closed port can be extended, but it's like basically a closed port that only exists to have these two nodes talk to each other. The consensus layer receives the information about what is going to be happening with the next block. Is there a reorg? Is there a, it's called a fork choice update? Is there a new, new payload of transactions that I need to secure? They send all this information to drive the execution client. The execution client says, okay, I've got a block payload. I've got a consensus payload. I'm going to do some EVM stuff, and I'm going to post that block to the chain. Small difference, consensus layer uses a REST API. Execution clients use JSON RPC. Different P2P networks. This one's called lib P2P. This one's called dev P2P. Similar enough. They gossip different things, and they're meant for different stuff. This is going to become a lot more robust. This meaning the consensus layer, the folks on the call, they're starting to build more and more functionality into the consensus layer now that we have a separation of concerns and focus this a lot more narrowly on EVM execution and world state management. Just think about it. All you really need to, to feed the EVM is what is currently the state of Ethereum. They don't give a crap about the other blocks, really. They do insofar as the world state, but they don't necessarily care about old stuff and consensus-based mechanisms, so they defer all of that up here. That's why it makes rollups a lot more interesting when you think about execution clients because all the consensus stuff is outsourced to the rollup sequencer to some of that other stuff to these different components we don't care about how consensus is reached we just start spitting out data as fast as possible about the world state and sometimes in the EVM. no so we we might build a light client in the base suit that allows you to connect and sync the chain but you will never be able to validate blocks or run a validator with just base. You will need an ex a consensus client like Teku, Lighthouse, Prism, uh, Nimbus, Lodestar, whatever. Yeah, we the, the, there are light APIs that allow you to connect and sync. We will probably be building those into base soon, so you can follow the chain and run data queries without having to run another layer, but not built quite yet. You need currently to sync mainnet, you need both. down here, and it has a big old bridge that goes to here. And that's pretty much the only evolution of those kinds of networks in terms of layer one on mainnet. You could, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but it, yeah, it basically sits on this execution client on mainnet because you have a bridge contract that's keeping track of the private state of the QVFT network and allows you to relay messages and transactions back and forth. And there's things like atomic swaps and cross-chain messaging, but it basically sits in a little chunk of this mainnet execution client that spreads every Ethereum node there is. Yeah, there's a variety of, yeah, bridge is not the only thing, but in terms of like a base to QBFT network, that's, Kind of the option as it is now. Depends on the data that you're looking for. Things like ETH call, all the good stuff get balanced. That's all down here. This is typically data. Analytics. This gets like the state of consensus on the chain, which is these are the people that need to vote soon. 
these are the votes. These are the peers that are doing this, this, and this. There's like subnets and committees and all this crap. That's housed up here. This is where the bulk of the data, because that's where the EVM is. That's where the contracts are. This, this is where the account balances are. The good stuff still sits here. But, you know, it, I frankly really like this picture because it separates out all the stuff that typically bogs down these clients and it puts it up here and it lets this focus on executing blocks as fast as possible and checking veracity of data. Any more questions on this slide? I only have five minutes left. <laughs> we have two client abstractions in Facebook, public network and the private network. Um, this is kind of what I'm getting at throughout this whole thing right here. The Engine API allows us to have pluggable consensus going forward. This is a somewhat aspirational picture. However, it, it's true, right? You're directing the EVM from the consensus layer and everything else exists to support this. Literally, everything else, except maybe tiering. But literally everything exists to support these two things which drive public network consensus, and that could be proof of stake. It could be roll-up consensus. API, I can fake it. I can run a sort of proof of stake client that makes use of these engine API calls to deliver payloads to Basu's EVM. And that's what we see in roll-ups, the proof of authority roll-up that we built on Basu, that's what we do. We kind of fake it through the engine API. So this is going to blow the whole thing open, and I, this is a versioned uh, spec. So the core devs consistently update what this does and how it looks, and we consistently update formats to support new data. But the key part is that it's extensible. This is what you know, I potentially love. We have the privacy components here. With Casera, we add in a sub-protocol specifically for BFT-related consensus. It allows us to network in the appropriate way that Antoine touched on earlier. And then we have the actual consensus things. I mean, we still have proof of work, right? We still have e-hash. You can use it in a private network. I don't know why you would. Pluggable consensus, it still is pluggable, right? You can choose what you want. Everything else is the same. We want to decouple these abstractions over time. I would like a lot of these pieces to not be so close together. I'd like this to live over here. I'd like this to live down here. I'd like this to live over here. Um, and I'd like all of this stuff to be. We've, in order to support both of these, namely this, these two, this, uh, the QBFT consensus and these pluggable consensus things, we've done a lot of tight coupling uh, with these sub protocols, the protocol schedule, and it's turning into a spaghetti mess. And we're looking to Split this out. When I'm talking about split this out, just don't worry about this. This is not a functional change. This is resolution of tech debt. We're looking at decouple these over time and make them more usable and hopefully more extensible. Because in reality, the Ethereum node looks like this. You have an RPC interface in the outside world, networking that goes back and forth to the RPC interface, potentially to other peers. Ends up in the transaction pool goes to the EVM, which is frankly optional in the case of Besu. goes to the state storage and back, goes to the consensus mechanism and back, and then it's a round trip. It, again, oversimplification, but we really only need this. And all of these pieces can kind of like come and go. That's an awesome idea, and we haven't explored that, but I'm going to write that down. <laughs> 
So again, we are trying to decouple these pieces because we want a bunch of different stuff. Reusable building blocks, mainnet POS chains. I have all the pieces I just mentioned. This blue box is no longer a basic box. It's kind of a basic box, but I gave it a little bit. <laughs> Private network, basic components, other stuff, right? Look at how similar these two things are. Roll up, state storage, roll up state. I might need a state to keep track of potentially what's happening on layer one and in the roll up. So I might need to add a new module if I have like a double box. Sequencer, still externally driven consensus. However, a little bit of green for the base soup box because we might still build these components in base soup. Anyway, same things, EVM is optional, you can rip it out. Fiber network, exactly the same. Bridge contracts over layer. So like these were kind of throwaway slides, but what I'm trying to say is all these components are the same, but the base suit picture looks like this. It doesn't look like these discrete boxes. We're trying to get there. So that is, I think a perfect segue for me to go back to the roadmap, right? What am I talking about here? Base suit is a roll up engine. Portable cryptography, self explanatory. We use crypto functions to secure stuff. Roll of compatible state management. That's that state management piece I was just talking about. New RPC formats. Talking about the engine API, talking about RPC, I think it's like account abstraction. This is the first step. This is not a complete thing. Down here, trying to build flexible roll of packages. That means separating all those little boxes so that we can stack them however we want. It might mean Instead of a uh, basic driven consensus engine, I defer to something like the optimism sequencer and base who simple. On the EVM, but not really. So again, just trying to separate all those building blocks into different components, ultimately to go here, where we take those building blocks and we get all the chains for free if we want them. Um, frankly, this is probably the biggest lie on the whole slide deck to see. Um, but we're, we're going to get aggressive with this going forward. We, we need to split the code base open because I want it to be easy to maintain private network features without breaking stuff because we want more people to maintain the private network features. So we're really looking forward to continuing this modular work to get those blocks to be discrete so that we can get to where we need to go. Now brings me to my last point and then we'll do some quick Q and A. Hearing and contributing to BASU and core development. All of what I just said is again, my plus like the consensus vision. It's not the only vision for BASU. We want everyone to contribute. How do we do that today? BASU is primar primarily maintained by contributors from consensus, Squirrel Labs, and Robert Splunk. Um, these contributors are primarily focused on public networks. That's true of almost everybody. Probably YouTube, maybe not. Yeah, whatever. Again, Web3 Labs, Connor and his team are going to be helping us a lot with this going forward. We want more people to help take on this mantle. We have existing guidelines. I'm sure this deck will be shared by heart. But this links you to a page that tells you exactly what you need to do. We have bi weekly contributor calls, they are open forum, and we have multiple time zones to support Australia and Asia and the US and EU time zones. We have a public demo board. You can go see exactly what our backlog is, what we're building, what bugs we have prioritized. If you don't see your bug, sorry, get there. And you can check everything out. This is mainly maintained by me, so you'll probably mostly see consensus folks moving things around. Again, I would also like that to change. Code contributions, it's very straightforward. Again, contributor calls, we have a lot of labels, different examples, bugs, census related issues, dependency update, developer experience. This is one to call out doc change required. If you update something that needs a documentation chain, use this label and the docs team at consensus will come scoop it up and fix it. Um, good, good first issue. If you're looking to start contributing code, go here. It's very simple stuff. Uh, you know, an ETC label if it's for Ethereum Classic, an EIP label if it's for mainnet improvement proposal, Yada, yada, yada. Um, we try to make it easy, really. Uh, you need 
10 or so pull requests to become an active maintainer. An active maintainer can approve pull requests into the main repository. That, that is to say, you can still contribute without being an active maintainer. Your contributions will always be reviewed by one of the maintainers. We try to do it within a few days. So we love external support. Um, we actively triage and support all of those things. So if you're building a PR in Spaceu, you'll have engineers that have been working on it for years reviewing it within a couple of days. We are working on additional technical documentation. I'd like to do things like break down the EVM library, break down the protocol schedule, um, and more. I'm thinking that we will do some kind of content series where the Baseu engineers run through what a lot of these abstractions are and what they mean. Like similar to what you did, but like actually kind of break down the protocol schedule, break down how all these different network types work. Um, there are certain things that when you touch them in the code base will have weird side effects. However, we have a really robust uh, set of tests and pipeline. So the anytime you submit a pull request to the basic repo, they'll check it against our um, pipeline and we'll hopefully highlight some stuff. Yeah, so one good thing about that is in two weeks, the BASU incentive program will pay for that CI. So once withdrawals are enabled, we will hopefully have free infrastructure. Um, we hopefully will have also more money if ETH goes up a lot to pay for bugs and grant bounties to do stuff. Um, one thing to note that I actually don't know if I included in the slides is that BASU participates in a client incentive program. Park mentioned it the other day. If you contribute on BASU up to a certain point on mainnet related issues, you can literally get paid by the Ethereum Foundation. Um, that, that is good optics for organizations. It's good optics for individuals, whatever capacity you choose. Um, there's also the protocol all guilds. These are a whole bunch of other topics, but to say, Building on mainnet is rewarding. Building on base is rewarding. I'd like to use the remaining CIP funds to incentivize all kinds of stuff, not just mainnet, but you can get paid too. It's. Yeah, yeah pop into the base who contributors channel here. If you've got spare computing power and brain power, we want it. Any of the existing processes I just mentioned can be changed. We have an open governance process. We have relatively flexible stuff that goes in the contributor calls, and we're pretty active about accepting and moving proposals. Yeah. You only need maintainer status to approve PRs in the main repo. Doesn't mean you can't code today and get PRs approved. We hang out in the Discord. You can reach all the engineers and contributors here. Don't post technical questions here. Post process-related, project-related questions here. We have other channels for tech. That's the link. Some new proposals. I would ideally like to do what I'm doing now on a quarterly basis or a half, one-half basis. A uh, product update of some kind, Steerco, what have you, because um, I'm getting a lot of looks slash questions that have proven that these things are useful and people are learning stuff. So doesn't necessarily even have to be in person. I'm very comfortable to sit in my house and to lecture for an hour. So I, you know, again, this is a new proposal. Biannual core development review to align Ethereum improvement proposals and standards. What does this mean? Basically, what core devs changes are coming that will impact what you do if you choose to use the latest versions of PC? Um, that will be Again, these are just proposals. I don't know if anyone wants this, but I will. I already do these calls for consensus and for other organizations. I can either open the existing calls and just record and share, or I can do the same thing that have Q and A and interactive session where I break down everything that's happened in Ethereum for this group. This one, who knows? Public issue triage call. I triage issues once a week, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, we could do that on like a rolling basis and people could send representatives and, and stuff. Question in the back. Uh, 
Uh, I don't have that. Uh, on mainnet, the core differences come down to some small differentiators. As far as private networks are concerned, Basu just slams them kind of all in terms of functionality and features. Uh, there are a million comparisons online, but I specifically don't have one. Gasp is the gold standard, fastest execution speed, but a lot of storage. Basu has some of the slower execution speed, but it doesn't really matter once you reach a certain point. However, we have the lowest storage requirements of any of the main clients. Nethermind sits somewhere in the middle, and their focus is just providing a good validator experience. No, they cannot. So it depends. Well, it depends on. This. So the question was, can layer two participants access other information on chain for the other transactions? And it's up to the design of the rollup. Um, but from all the ones that I have seen, privacy is a key selling point, and they do not reveal transaction details to each other. Any other questions in the call or in the chat? All right, I'm going to breeze through this in some overtime. Why does core development matter? This is. Uh, Changing gears now, when I talk about core development, I mean Ethereum core development. It's just a loose group of people that anyone can be involved in that develop the Ethereum protocol. Getting involved in core development reduces platform risk for you and your organization as you move to public networks and even on private networks if you're taking the latest basic updates. More voices in core development deepens collaboration and opens the door for progressive decentralization of your organizations and also for bringing the values of larger institutions in CFI to Ethereum be a good give and take. Yeah, we, this is what we really need, an understanding of business and regulatory requirements to the core development community. The Ethereum developers are, all they care about is the technology side. We need more voices talking about regulatory requirements and how we can service them in core development. Uh, that could be standards that we can iterate on with both technologists, researchers, and kind of regulatory folks and you know financial folks can mean a bunch of things, but in reality, this is sorely needed because we just build the technology essentially in a vacuum where we need to start caring about financial, like we need to start getting involved in regulation in order to bring more uh, commerce on chain. Web 2 to Web 3 migration requires collaboration and core development protocol updates are constantly in the news. If you care about uh, growing your brand and your name, my name is all over a bunch of random crap now. So. All core devs execution call. There's two calls once a week, every two weeks. I am part of the execution layer call because Basu is an execution layer client. Uh, it's the execution ACDE is what's called. This is the biggest decision making body of Ethereum protocol development as it stands right now. Um, it is fortnightly, which is my British colleague's way of saying every two weeks on, on Thursday at roughly 11 Eastern or 10 Eastern rather. It's live streamed on YouTube, Zoom. You can join the Zoom. It's not a closed group. Like I said, anybody can join the Zoom. They share the link in Discord. And it's mainly client developers and R&D researchers. But we've started to see more and more interested parties like Coinbase, DeFi applications, potentially some actual you know, workers from banks and other things. But I want this to go up. There's an ill-defined consensus process among how we include things in hard forks, how we de design the protocol, and it's typically based on urgency of what's next. All core devs consensus layer call, same thing. Same thing. It boils down to EIPs. This is the decision making process. Did it not go? Oh, this is oh, okay. I'm not gonna go through this. There's five types of EIPs. This is the one you need to be worried about. Or EIPs change the way that BASU works fundamentally. It means that we need to change something via a hard fork. And if mainnet requires a hard fork, your network will require changes. I'm going to say that right now. If you, again, this is presuming that you update your base nodes at some regular cadence. ERCs, this is where I see most of this group actually getting involved. These are smart contract level application standards that I think we can start to bring in more regulatory compliance and some of these things. 
Uh, and once account abstraction launches, this will blow the door off of what we can do on behalf of users, which I think we will need to do in terms of regulatory bodies, things like you know social recovery, FD, like insurance, all that good stuff. This lets us. This will let us protect users. These are simple. They don't really matter too much. Um, these are typically both in relation to the core EIPs. So if you need to do networking gossip stuff because of this, you don't care. Meta EIPs are about information changing the way that Ethereum does stuff. Not super useful for this group. Informational EIPs are about design uh, and they're just kind of little bulletins. Okay. Sorry for the 15 minutes over, but uh, do we have any additional questions? I know I breezed through the core development stuff, but I am struggling to think of a way to get this group involved in like a kind of dip your toes way. It is a very much encompassing process. It takes up a lot of my time. Um, but it try it's think of it as developing the internet, right? We want it, the internet to work in a certain way because it's where we do business. If you see your business is moving in this direction, you'll need to be involved in the development of the protocol. And whether that's just consuming information, being aware of what's possible, or directly steering EIPs, I think it's valuable to engage, and I am happy to be a conduit for anything related to that. Any more questions? Yeah.